Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tuesday, September 6th, the Watertown City Work Session agenda. At this time, I will call the meeting to order, and the first up is uh, discussion of a community block grant. So, uh, Boys and Girls Club, you guys are right up here. Come up and introduce yourselves and fill us in. Welcome. We also have, uh, yeah, why don't you give them a hand speaker there that they can, her microphone. Perfect. Welcome tonight. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for having us. My name is Lewis Canfield, uh, Director of Operations with the Boys and Girls Club. I'm Liz Christensen. I don't know if that's on. Just need to push that. There you go. There we go. Liz Christensen, Executive Director at the Boys and Girls Club. Ted Hader with First District here in Watertown. All right, and uh, we're just going to uh, just just update you briefly here with the uh, the Boys and Girls Club and our capital campaign project. As you guys know, we've been taken under this last year. Um, we're at a standstill here with our with our campaign, which has been going very very well. Um, Liz will kind of tell you a little bit more specifically on that. But uh, just in in overall, you know, we are definitely moving forward with our with our capital campaign project. Things are very very busy at the Boys and Girls Club. We're seeing nearly 400 kids after school every single day. Uh, so we're very excited uh, to take over the the new space when the rec center relocates to the north side of town. Um, but with that, uh, we, we uh, want to continue our project, and, and uh, we're, we have an opportunity to apply for a community block grant. Uh, so we're asking the city to be our sponsor of that tonight, and I'll let, uh, let Liz kind of continue on that. Sure. Okay, just to give you a little bit of an update of, of where we're at so far, um, we just completed our active um, part of our fundraising campaign um, just here a couple weeks ago and came out very successfully raising about $4.1 million dollars. Um, we'll follow that up, ending our fundraising in the end of the year, November and December. So we'll take a break right now during the United Way blackout time. Um, construction planning is, is ongoing. Um, we will be finalizing kind of our budget and blueprints um, in January of 2017. We will approve those and then go on to the bidding process in either February or March. Um, after that point, we will then relocate our club services to Garfield Elementary for about one year, um, just for safety and efficiency of the project. It's best for us to remove ourselves um, for that whole construction period. Hope to begin construction in mid to late summer of 2017, and we will complete construction looking at summer of 2018 and hope to move back into our beautiful new facility at that time. Um, our entire estimated project budget is $4.8 million. Um, like I said, we have raised so far $4.1 million, and that's where we are coming to ask for your assistance tonight to help us with the last remaining funds so that we can complete the entire project at one time. Um, we've done very well with our campaign so far, and if you would have asked us a year ago, you know, we didn't really know where we'd be exactly. Um, so we hope to complete our construction, um, have a contingency fund, do the parking and outdoor space, which is what we're going to be talking to tonight um, with the community block grant, um, purchase our fixtures and equipment, and also fund the endowment. So I have Ted Hader from First District here. He's our representative from First District, who's our li liaison with, um, I guess, the governor's office and the community block grant um, initiative. Maybe he can explain a little bit just about what the community block grant is. Sure. The community development block grant uh, consists of HUD funds that are given to the state of South Dakota on an annual basis and used for projects like sewer water, infrastructure projects of that like, boys and girls clubs, Head Start facilities, and this fits perfectly because one of the primary components is to serve low and moderate income persons. And I think we're going to find out once the income survey is complete with the boys and girls club families, we're going to serve way more people than we need percentage-wise. The Boys and Girls Club would be a sub-recipient on this one with the City of Watertown being the primary applicant because the Community Development Block Grant requires a unit of local government, either a county or a city, to sponsor an application. October 1st is our upcoming deadline 
and that's why we're here tonight is to get everything in so we can meet the Boys and Girls Club timeline and move this project forward. As you can see on the um, attachment, um, we have a couple of photos. So what we're really hoping to focus on for the community block grant funds is our outdoor space. That would include the parking facilities um, around the immediate Boys and Girls Club, but also spreading all across um, around the high school, around 3rd Avenue and 11th Street. And in addition to the parking, um, we would like to host an outdoor recreation center for our youth. That's where our current parking lot is right now. Um, that will be a secure fenced in area with a playground structure, four square basketball, um, picnic benches, really just an extension of our indoor space so that we can serve kids in a safe and controlled environment when it is nice outside to get them outdoors and keep them active and healthy. So Louis, do you wanna walk them through kind of some of those high points of the drawings? And Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you look at the last page in the handout there. Do, do you want to put that up on the board? He could. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You sure Justin, can. You could, there you go. Just set it right. Oh, you've got me. Okay. Now, this is just an artist's rendering, but this is uh, really to give us a good idea of what this space really could be. Um, again, this is the space uh, which is just north of our building. Um, let me see if I can get my bearings here. Um, this would be our new uh, west entrance here. That would be facing north towards Allen Mitchell Field. Uh, we want to reconfigure the parking lot so it, it, uh, cars would park the same way as the high school uh, students do right now. Uh, and of course, they would still have access to the parking lot. They, they use a good portion of that. And so it would be a, a really a win-win for them uh, and us as well. Uh, and then if you look, again, this is just an artist rendering. These, uh, this is not necessarily exactly how we're going to do it. But as Liz mentioned, we really want a safe, supervised area where kids can go in once they get access to the building, they would only be able to, to get to this, this playground area if they had uh, gained access to the club. And then they had to go out through a side door, uh, have supervision out there where they could play uh, and, and be engaged in just diff different variety of activities out there. Um, definitely some kind of a play structure, some basketball, um, some four square. Uh, we're, we're getting the kids uh, involved in, in the planning process. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of things that they want that we definitely can't do. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, I think it'll be a lot nicer to have something like this as opposed to what we're currently doing, which is walking kids across that parking lot, uh, across streets, which gets get busy, especially during certain times of the day with Lake Erie Tech and high school right there. Mm -hmm. So the benefits of the project really will be to reduce drop-off and pick-up um, concerns. Like Lewis said, there's a lot of traffic um, going into the, in and out of that parking lot. So with our new west entrance, it will have um, kind of a one-way in, one-way out parking structure, very similar to a school, so that our immediate customers can park in that area and not have two-way traffic crossing their path. Um, that will just increase safety of walkers, like Lewis said as well. Um, many kids do walk um, back and forth to the Boys and Girls Club, and at any one day, you know, we have lots of kids coming from many directions, and, and we need to keep the cars away from our facility. The outdoor play factor, um, just increasing recreation, you know, for our children and keeping them active is always important. Providing parent convenience, um, we want to offer parents, you know, a great solution to be able to get in and out of our facility very quickly. And then just, I guess, increasing the whole flow and aesthetics of the whole project. Um, we want, you know, the, the parking structure to flow over to the high school and back behind on the east side of the Boys and Girls Club to make it look very uniform, make it very appealing, um, attractive to our audience and to the school district. So those are kind of, the, excuse me, the benefits of reconfiguring our, our parking and our outdoor recreation space. Our total application, um, that we'll be putting forward to the Community Block Grant Committee will be 515000 Anything else, Ted? Yeah. In the application, we'll identify total project costs, including the building renovations, the parking work, and the outdoor recreation area. Mm -hmm. And assuming we get in for this October 1st deadline, we should hear back on funding by November or December from the state, whether the project has received funding, and if so, at what level? The total 
project cost of the outdoor, the parking facility, and the recreation center, um, right now we have an estimate of 682000 Again, that's an estimate from our architect and our engineer. Um, so we're, we're really looking at this as a win-win-win um, situation for the city of Watertown because that property is city-owned. Um, we will be helping the school district in you know, helping to maintain and improve their parking facilities and also, of course, a win for the Boys and Girls Club for safety and flow. So we feel this is a, a good project. Um, I think that you know it would really be nice to complete it all at one time, not have to wait and you know complete this portion in a year or two. If we're going to do it and, and we have the funds, then it would just make it a lot more efficient to complete it all at one time. Well, perfect. Uh, any questions from anybody here? Liz, one of the questions that comes yeah. up to me is, have, did, have they thought about how to make it run after you get it built, do you have the money to keep it going then with additional staff? I mean, you're talking about increasing student numbers from 400 to 600. Mm -hmm. So that's the question. And I have said, well, yep. I'm assuming that. We completed a business plan with five-year budget projections. And, and obviously, um, when you're serving more youth, yes, it is going to take more funds to serve those youth. Um, staffing won't change, you know, too much. We have a lot of... Um, you know, reconfiguring that we can do with, with a more efficient building. Um, yes, we will have, you know, additional operational costs, and, and that's where the endowment comes into play as well. So with being able to fund our endowment fund, you know, we will be able to take a 5% disbursement off that if we do need to, you know, per year. So we've done the projections. We feel very confident with the added space that we will be able to maintain a healthy, you know, budget with, with keeping things profitable, you know, or I guess able to run our operations as we as we need to well perfect this is exciting yeah well, one thing I'd, I'd like to add to that is is uh, you know it's really exciting to hear when you guys exceeded your goal you know that tells you a lot about the great city we live in you know over the years when when the Boys and Girls Club have stepped up to the plate and had to go out and raise money to build expansions and, and this ain't, this ain't the first boat you've ever been in put it that way but it's really exciting to know the people of Watertown really step up and, and they support the kids and youth of Watertown. You know, that is the future of our city. So mm -hmm. really exciting to uh, to see that happen. So, yeah. And if we are chosen to be, a, you know, a recipient of the grant funds, that will be getting us very close to, to meeting our budget um, of where we feel we need to be. So this is a, a really exciting step for us to take. And like I said, I think we have a very qualified application with serving um, the percentage of youth that need to be disadvantaged or are considered a, a lower poverty level. Um, we think we're going to be able to meet that with, with flying colors. And, and this is just kind of the last piece and putting the whole puzzle together to do it all at once. Sounds good. Well, that will be um, on our agenda tonight, number five okay. and number six on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, yeah. They will have a, a vote on that this evening. Appreciate your support. Thank you very Thank much, you, much, you guys. Yeah, thanks. Okay, moving on. Number three, presentation of South Dakota Hall of Fame inductee. This is an exciting time for us, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Joy? Which, which way? Right here? Either way. All right. I'm Jan Well, welcome. Johnson, Karen, you need I'm to, uh, uh, Jan, you need to put the, the button there. Right here. Now? Oh, yeah. yeah, I hear it myself. <laughs> no, okay. you're good. You're good, now. I'm Jan Johnson, and I'm here on behalf of the South Dakota Hall of Fame. And I hardly need to introduce Joy <laughs> Nelson to you. As we all know, she's a successful businesswoman, a philanthropist, and, of course, a horse lover. <laughs> but this weekend, she is going to be inducted into the South Dakota Hall of Fame at our honors banquet in Chamberlain. As a board member, I had the privilege of both advocating for her and also helping to choose her to become a member of the South Dakota Hall of Fame. And I can tell you that my fellow board members, after hearing about the vision and the scope of Joy Ranch, were very enthusiastic about her induction. 
This past weekend, I was watching a little news segment on TV, and they talked about um, kids with cancer being able to go to a horse farm, I think it was on the East Coast, for camp. And they talked about the therapeutic value of being able to do that, uh, the fact that horses are gentle and that you can, uh, if you ride, it can help reduce stress, it helps with muscle tone, coordination. And as I watched that, I thought, they could be talking about Joy Ranch. They could. <laughs> they could be talking about Joy Ranch. And I thought that was really cool. And as I, I think about it, uh, Joy Ranch's mission of being inclusive to all, regardless of abilities, is what really caught the attention of the Hall of Fame. But I like to say that Joy Ranch is a magical place. And it is the inspiration of joy that makes that place so magical. And so, I thank you for your time this evening, and I would like you to congratulate Joy, not only for what she does in this community, but also for her induction into the South Dakota Hall of Fame. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm obviously just honored beyond belief and humbled to my knees with this induction, but um, I've, I've met some incredible people through this whole process, some of the other inductees and board members of the South Dakota Hall of Fame, and I'm thrilled that I can represent Watertown in this process, and uh, most of you do, do know me, and I, I love to work on projects for our state, but also for our community, and uh, I just love to make life better for all the citizens of South Dakota, so thank you. Thanks, and Joy. thank you. Uh, Jan, I, I was just gonna throw out, I mean, you put so many different names on Joy. The only thing that you didn't mention was her being a, a little pit bull. Yeah, he, true, mean, true. He, yeah. <laughs> That's if what the mayor <laughs> calls me. <laughs> <laughs> if she wants something done, or if you need something done, you call Joy, and it's yeah, going to get done. Yeah, they best Thanks, do it, Joy. right? <laughs> I'll see you there Saturday night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. That's pretty great. Okay, well, we're going to move on to uh, number four, discussion on the 10th Avenue vacation request. Now, this is also something that's on your, your uh, agenda this evening. Uh, we'll be looking at two items on there. One is, uh, I don't know the numbers straight out, but I thought maybe we could just have a quick discussion on that, Shane, and I'll let you uh, kind of take it over if you can put that up on the screen for us. Okay, I'll do a little recap then. Um, the area hatched in yellow <coughs> was the first petition that the city received um, with a request to vacate a portion of 10th Avenue South. That was taken to the Planning Commission, discussed at length there, and ultimately was uh, recommended for approval uh, to be brought to the Council for uh, subsequent action on the vacation. Upon learning of that vacation, the owners on the east half of the bl that block of 10th Avenue South also then sub subsequently submitted a petition to vacate that portion of the roadway as well. There are three owners on the second vacation where there was only one owner on the first vacation. So um, there, the owner in the, I'll call it beigey pink on the south is one owner. Spies, who is part of the first request, would get this orangey piece here, and the blue is, um, I believe, uh, Wiles' uh, attorney. So those are the parties that are requesting the vacation. Staff has reviewed it, and again, the second vacation um, process was also taken through the Planning Commission and with a recommendation for further action for by the council. So with that, I guess I'll ask if there's any questions. And what I had hoped for this evening by asking Shane to put this up and have a few discussion on it uh, uh, right now, we do have a long agenda this evening and I thought we could uh, kind of visit about this. If you have questions, now's the time to ask. So tonight when we go and we're voting upon this, you'll be pretty informed on it. 
Chain, I drove down there and, and tried to look at that. There is no real access to that. That right now is there. It's all pretty well covered with trees and. Yes, it would take. Um, in order to improve 10th Avenue South, you would have to remove a number of trees in that um, grove that's probably been shrinking over the last 30 years. But uh, and there would take a fair amount of fill. We could squeeze the road in. Um, so that it's not that that road can't be built there, but uh, it certainly um, isn't uh, expected to be developed. And and the reality is, is the current owners along there that are petitioning for this would also be the folks that would um, be expected to fit the bill if the road was improved. So with that in mind, I guess uh, if they don't want a road there, um, we can reserve the right of way for a future road, but at some point in time, um, somebody's going to have to finance that road, and right now that would be the yeah. owners that exist there today. The likelihood of that ever happening in that area is probably pretty slim anyhow. So, Yes, it's not a complete roadway segment as it doesn't connect to Highway 81 is yep. one, one major consideration. If that other part wasn't already vacated, then it'd be a different story, but it's the farthest east part, so... Well, as I recall, and from discussions, prior discussions, uh, there was some interest in the, the value of that property. And I'm just going to bring up two points. One is the value of the property. If we had the intention to to put some sort of a price tag on this, and, and the second thing was the possibility of some access to to the east. Those are the two concerns that we had before. Um, you know, I think Randy's probably right. I mean, the odds of this ever really becoming a through road are probably not very good. But I do know that there were some concerns by some of the folks that aren't here tonight. One of the things we did talk about was a right of waiver to protest. And, and uh, Justin, we discussed that a little bit. Um, I don't know if that's applicable here or not. And especially if they're going to build right, my understanding is that the folks to the to the northwest wanted to, um, I think that's spies, I believe, were thinking about building up right up to the property line is that correct that's correct yeah so i don't i don't know justin do you see any possibility of utilizing that right of waiver to protest on that in case we ever did want to put a road in if it, the thing is i think if they put those buildings there you're just kind of in a pickle you wouldn't be able to do it uh, it's it's a matter of you know if you want to reserve a right of way there um you can't you know, you can't go through the process of vacation. Uh, there isn't any sort of in-between there uh, that state statute envisions. And since our ordinances on vacation derive from state statute, I couldn't come across any authority that would uh, allow us that flexibility, which is too bad. But Thanks. Anybody else have any concerns um, about uh, vacating this? That, Like I say, you'll be seeing this tonight. I did go to the plan commission meeting when they talked about it and they really didn't have any reservation at all about it. It was brought up about the value of it, but I don't think that people thought it was ever going any place. So it was not going any, you know, it really doesn't have any value if it's, and I think one of the concerns was is make, if that road ever had to connect so you could get out on 212, that was one of the things that said, well, we could put a road in there if we have the if we have the uh, property there and we wouldn't be able to if but I don't know if that's that didn't seem to be an issue anyway yeah but Dan if you look at the stuff to the west they've already built buildings right up to the property line and which would be what would that be third if I were, yeah so we're already kind of past that point of of no return on that one so and as far as putting a value on that justin there, there's no way we can put a value on that is there legally or that's correct councilman um you know the the vacation process is the one means of converting a right of way dedicated to public use to private use and uh you can't put a value on that because value uh is effectively not a part of the the decision making process set out in statute for vacating the the concern uh, as far as the south dakota supreme court has found is that the land cannot be vacated the right of way cannot be vacated for a purely private purpose so there needs to be some sort of public 
purpose rationale, be it uh, you know, something associated with our police power, the public welfare, the public safety, the public health, uh, and any of the reasons that could come from those, those values, those concerns. One of the things that I think, Shane, you have been adamant about is that you want to keep 3rd Street open and 11th Avenue open. If, yeah. that, if I'm on the right street, so yes. I, is right in the middle. Yes, is so 3rd Street is the furthest, um, or yes, 3rd Street is the furthest west, north and south, and 4th Street, of course, is the next one. What I do want to do is maintain some type of connectivity, whether it be on 11th Avenue or 12th Avenue, we will create a, an option for those to cross. So the next considerations for vacations to the south would not be as uh, as amenable to the public, in our opinion. Right, so you basically would not entertain closing those, uh, vacating any of it. And I think that's important. So if there's no more questions on that, that'll be, like I say, on your agenda this evening. And, uh, and we'll move forward on that. So Thank then the you. next thing I would like you to uh, uh, discuss, if you could, Shane, is uh, the Weir Project. That's on our agenda tonight under the consent agenda, uh, letter D. And I just wanted to have you give uh, the council and, and the folks out in the audience an update on how we're doing on the Weir, where we're at, uh, and getting that accomplished. The Weir project, we've um, completed our plans, resubmitted a, our application for a permit to the Corps of Engineers. Um, we expect comments from that soon if, if they're going to have any. Um, they, if they have no, we'll respond to any comments that they bring forward to us. Then that process, once we reach a certain point, will go to a public notice, which is a mandatory 20-day public notice that's within the federal system that the Corps has to follow. And once we reach that uh, part of the project, we intend to advertise the, um, send out the advertisement for bids to the public so that when the 20 day period is over, we can react with bids as soon as possible and start getting a construction timeline set up. So we anticipate that to maybe um, arrive by the end of October at, at the latest. And is there any certain type of structure you're leaning more towards? Yes, we are, pl we are proposing to do a um, steel sheet pile um, weir extension, which is essentially the same type of material that exists in the current weir. Um, it will be either tied to or overlap the existing weir on the east end, and it will extend up to the high ground to the east approximately 360 feet. So what the idea of the full ex extension of 360 feet is that it would help cut off any future um, um, bends in the river that would try to develop and, and cut off those as well for the future. So, And when you're talking that amount of length, what kind of a dollars are you thinking that this stuff runs? I mean, just what's an engineer's estimate on it? Uh, I can't remember what the estimate was right off the top of my head, but it is around $400,000, I believe. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of dough. Yep. And, and I guess what I'm, where I'm thinking is, is that um, do we need 360 feet is what I, I guess where I'm coming at on that. Yes. You kind of got to build to that we're elevation. Bu yes, we're extending to the yeah. elevation that we need to match. Did, did you, in, in a previous conversation, I'd mentioned Gene Day has done this type of work before. Yep. We've reached out to Have two, you talked to him? Yep, we've, we've talked to two contractors that do this kind of work, and we expect that our estimate's high. Is but Gene we've, the same type of system, do you recall? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I did have a chance to visit with, with Gene also, and he so. did recommend putting in that steel screen. We're anticipating that our our estimate is high because we haven't done this type of work for 50 years, not to this extent. So it, we're just kind of throwing a, a bigger number out there so that we don't get shock from. And we want to be on, realistic on the high side, not realistic on the low side. So, so my question would be: Would it be steel? Is that what you're thinking? It'll be steel. Yes. It'll be steel. Yep. My question is, in the future, what are we going to do to prevent this from happening again? 
I mean, I, I know by building it, it's supposed to prevent from happening, but right. it, it kind of got, you know, it was recommended a number of years ago, kind of got swept under the rug. Right. Uh, what are we going to do to prevent that part from happening again to make sure that we do maintain it so we're not looking at $400,000? Well, um, we can extend this to the, as far as we are now, uh, very realistically. Um, beyond that, you know, whenever Mother Nature decides to change the course of the river, if it goes further to the east, that'll be a whole different discussion than, than what we're looking at right now. It, I guess it, you, I guess my comment would be more like, you know, we, we have somebody come in and inspect bridges every so often, I guess. So what are we going to do to, you know, maintain that part of it, so the integrity of... Right. So we're inspecting it, you know, once a year, once every three years so or whatever to make sure that correct. The integrity and we'll, hasn't been... And we'll set, establish a uh, maintenance schedule for the this portion of the weir. What we can't control is what happens upstream or downstream of this location, so... I, I just can't stress how important it is. I think that that needs to be done. You know, you continually see the lake going down, and we've had inches of rain. We should see the lake moving back up, but it, it just can't. I mean, with the breach that's over there right now. I did, um, I, I don't know, have you guys got any more questions on that? Because that's on the consent agenda, and that will be uh, approved tonight through that way if you, uh, if you so go. So if there's not, I'm going to step backwards. I did slip on that one uh, discussion on a city particip participation program for cost sharing and private installation of curb and gutter. And Shane, that's yours also if you want to. This is something that you've been looking at and, and just kind of, if you touch base on it, let people know kind of what is possibly coming up in the future. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, as you know, we've had a long-term uh, program out there which we cost share sidewalk improvements and maintenance of sidewalk has always been uh, mandated that the property owners are responsible for that however the city um, to uh, inspire people to u utilize and replace their sidewalks when they become dilapidated and and unusable to the public we've we decided to participate up to two dollars a square foot to give them an incentive to replace their sidewalk sooner than wait for somebody to fall and get hurt or, or some accident to happen. So with that, there's also a thought that, um, you know, we, we have curb and gutter along all of our city streets. I, I say all, but we all know that there's a few that don't have it. But the reality is, is that when those streets are built, you know, we put in different various services, whether it's water, sewer, or sewer service to the homes and then ultimately um, those trenches settle and then the curb that's installed over the top of those trenches fall in and it becomes a bird bath or a dip or some in some cases it actually becomes a impassable um, location right in front of the the curb so what we do is we we kind of wonder should we extend our public program into segments of replacement for curb and gutter and um, as we have it right now, I, I have had a couple requests for that type of, uh, of th thing. I did approve one earlier this year, but it was 100% paid by the property owner because he didn't have curb and gutter before, and he wanted it. We made sure that we did the engineering to make sure that it got built to city standards and, and it was done correctly. But that was a bill that a private individual that didn't have curb paid for. So now what we're being asked is, and it, I have a current request, and if my screen is up on there, this is in Marina Bay. This is a cul-de-sac around the uh, south end of Marina Bay. And uh, as I understand it, the Marina Bay uh, Association, Homeowners Association, is re making a request. And uh, I'm just going to drop in here, and we can look at what that curb looks like. So... As you can see, this is we're we're looking south, and you can see that the snow plows have broken up this curb in several locations around the bottom. This one's intentional. I'll I'll go forward here a little bit. This one is an intentional notch that handles the drainage off of here and allows water to leave the cold cold zac and end up in the lake via the lot next to it. But the homeowners 
association there is interested in replacing this beat up curb. Uh, they're proposing to do a uh, what's called a mountable curb or one that can be driven over, you know, that doesn't have the full six inch height as is our st city standard. Now we do have other city streets that don't have the full six inch curb as well. So, so Shane, I got a question for yep. you. Yep. Is, is a lot of this just aesthetics or, I mean, is that, is that curb and gutter functional? And, and, and I'll ask the same question for sidewalks too. Who determines at what point the disrepair of, of a sidewalk or a curb would be applicable for, you know, that we could fund that? Who decides that? I mean, if you had a guy that says, ah, you know, the sidewalk got a couple of cracks in it, doesn't look very good anymore. Right. I'd just like to put a new one in. You uh, said will the city partake? Right. That's my question. Who, right. how do we, because that looks like it may still be functional, but if, where do you go when, when a guy saw a couple of gouges and scratches, so I'd yeah. like the city to help me replace all this curb. I That's agree. My question. Uh, I, we, we uh, as far as the sidewalk program, that's mostly on the honor system. Um, you know, somebody brings in, let's be honest, most people aren't going to invest, you know, $1,000 or more in a sidewalk replacement unless they know that they're worried about somebody tripping and falling and getting hurt. This curb in a, is a slightly different animal, uh, and that's why we're here discussing this, because it is, it is different than a sidewalk where people are expected to walk and travel. Um, in my opinion, this curb looks bad, but it is still fairly functional. The, um, there are other areas in town where I would tell you that it's not functional. Um, for instance, we have on our schedule for 2016 a repair of North 15th Street up near 14th Avenue, and that's some places where the curb has been jacked around by frost. It's you know water's not draining correctly, those kind of issues. And it's more more important for me to to maybe take care of some of these private small issues. Um, as they come up, like for instance, I, I mentioned a, a settlement of a curb. I know, I've known places that have settled up to a foot in those locations, and you know, a foot bird bath doesn't look cool and it's full of water, but even when it's dry, it's a hazard. And uh, so what I really want to know is, in the end, if the city council is going to be willing to set up a program or some initiative to, to give homeowners some room to invest in what happens in front of their place. If, if, if we have beat up curb or we have uh, a curb that's settled and isn't functioning correctly, we on our own don't have the resources to go after all of those. Rob can't take care of them all um, on his budget either. So the real question is, do we want to entertain a system for curb and gutter similar to what we are with the sidewalk? And that would be a cost share. It wouldn't be a full share or anything like that. And they would have to be approved projects. They, we wouldn't just open the door and say, have at it. We would have to go review them and, and evaluate them and make sure that they're valid candidates. What's it cost? To the, what's a foot of curb cost? Okay, so gutter? that is a... Um, Good question, and our curb prices that the city sees for remove and replace varies all over due to size of projects. That range actually is substantial between $20 and $40 a foot. And what, what are you thinking for the city share? Well, I wouldn't exceed $20 a foot myself, but I wouldn't recommend that. But, um, you know, we're, we're, for small seg sections of curb like what's being requested in this instance we would probably expect forty dollars a, a foot or higher and, and actually what we were told on this case is that it would be higher than forty dollars a foot to get this done they have a contractor that that has identified um, that they would do this work for four thousand dollars we would probably expect it to be about twenty eight hundred you know something like that but uh, so and, and, and Shane, what you're looking at, this is just a small piece of curbing for the city of Watertown, you know, that's in tough shape. I don't know how much you would literally have to budget for something like that. 
you could be talking uh, easily fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year out of our budget. That would just be our cost share. Well, it could be it could be big bucks. That's why we would have to set a very fine um, review system and know that first of all, I would only want to consider places that are modern curb. I I consider this a modern curb section. We have a lot of town that it just has that old square curb, which is only the back and no gutter pan. I would like to categorically exclude all, exclude all of those from consideration of a program. So we would look at, this is a way to help with the mill and overlay program, help with the chip seal programs, to where you're in the more modern parts of town that have obvious issues with drainage that if we fix those little ones along the way, then when we come by with mill and overlay it, we don't have a puddle that's sitting right next to a brand new um, section of road. That's kind of where I would like to see it go. Not necessarily, I mean, this is a, a good example of why it needs to be discussed here on this, on this request, but it's a, it's a significant issue. I, I would like it if, if you could, when you're driving to and from work or around town, especially in the portions of the town that are, are 1970s and newer, look around and see how many dips in the curb you see. How many places does the water not make it to a catch basin because the water, you know, water flows to it and then it sits in a puddle. Um, you know, we've had some recent rain showers. There's probably still a fair amount of puddles out there. And, and those are the kinds of things that a little program like this could fix. And we would have to fix a budget, Mayor, and once that budget is exhausted, the people would have to wait till the next year to be on the list, uh, if, right. if that's you know, what it took. One of the things I'm looking at, Shane, and, and uh, I, I don't, you talked about, well, we wouldn't look at those little square ones. And to me, in fact, those are the ones that we should be trying to help out. Well, because those, those are the ones that look, they, they got about two inches of curb left right. on them. Yep. Those, frankly, in my opinion, are the ones that are needed more than Right. like this yes but they require a substantial project to fix because you need to <laughs> fix those grades from end to end of a block not just w little patches is what I, i'm expecting these to be you know 20 to 30 foot patches i'm not expecting you know blocks and blocks or hundreds of feet you know because most people uh, honestly aren't going to spend 40 dollars a foot for for a hundred foot section to to do that, I mean, I don't I don't have four thousand dollars to throw in the public street, so I would put up with the headache before I would invest in that. But so I, I'm looking at a little bit smaller scope than what this request is, but it, I I just want it to be considered, and, and I, I'm at the liberty of whatever the council likes to do, but. Shane, I have another quick question for you. You mentioned that I, I always call them drive over curbs. Mm -hmm. Have we done any of those of, since you've been here that you're aware of? Not since I've been here. There are several subdivisions that were done prior to my arrival. Because um, I know that in the past, we, the, the, the Planning Commission had very little propensity for drive over curbs. Yep. You know, it, when we did Dakota Commons, that, that was the original intent was to do that. Mm -hmm. And we talked them out of that. Uh, yep. Maybe they've changed their stance on that a little bit. I don't know. But uh, I'm not a fan, but that doesn't mean we, no. we, sh we shouldn't yep. necessarily uh, have them. I, yeah. I, I kind of like them. I, I, I don't think I was talking about them. Anybody else have any comments about the curbing? I, I got one quick question for maybe yep. Shelly or Shane, whoever can answer it. And maybe it's unfair to ask it because you don't have your proper books with you, but we set aside a X amount of dollars every year for the sidewalk project. Yes, no? Correct. Has it ever been reached, what we set aside, or ever been, have we ever had to turn anybody down for no, reaching that? No, we have not run out of funds. Okay. I think, I think there's a... Yeah, we have some other things yet that, uh, you want to talk curb? Yes, I do. Okay, just quickly, though. Ken Madison, I reside out at, uh, in the Bayview townhomes. And um, one thing I wanted to point out is that the damage that you see there, uh, I believe, and I think that Rafe Mack and Mark Ryerson would agree with me, is due more to not so much the snow plows 
as um, payloaders, city payloaders that come in. Uh, we have snow removal out there with a private individual. Uh, and he piles the snow down in that corner. It's about the only reasonable, logical place to put it. And then it stays there until the city comes and removes it with their payloaders. And I believe that most of that damage has been done by the payloaders coming to scoop up from that pile and not knowing exactly where the curb is when they're digging into it. Um, and so that's the reason that we, if this can be taken care of, that we would like to see the drive over curb so that in the future we're not doing this again, you know, another 20 years down the road or something. Yes, I would agree. Yes, it's functional. But how many of you would like to have a curb like this outside of your house? We have spent a lot of money out there over the 10 years that I've been there improving our property. We repainted everything. We put new roof shingles on. We've done a lot of individual re-landscaping on our property. We've done a lot of things to make it look good, and we're proud of it, but we're not real proud of this. And our, our feeling is that if this damage was caused by the city, which I think anybody with any reasonable uh, approach to this, um, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I'm a lake scientist, and I know a few things, and I would say that this is damage done by the city, and we would like it to look better. We'd like the city to participate and Rob, help us take care of it. Rob, could Can you come up here, oh. please? My question. My question to you, Rob, is why are we picking up snow out there when, when I was normally just gonna you would just push it on the curb? If I'm in town, I have to put up with that snow on my curb all year long. I don't... You right. don't come and remove the snow off of my well, we, we have my some of the cul-de-sacs out at the lake um, where we've had complaints that there's too much snow in the way. So we'll take some of that snow out occasionally if it's One of the, the things I see in town on cul-de-sacs is that you push the snow to the center. And then we... And you go around, and then you come and you pick it up from the center. You don't go somewhere in the corner. What's the deal? Right. That out there, we do have a contractor that blades that up for us. And I personally haven't been out there to see if it's always getting circled up or pushed to the end. And pushed to the end. Pushed to the end. So it is, we do it different in town is what the, the deal is. So, But we have had calls from locations out at the lake, the cul-de-sacs mainly, where we've gotten complaints. So we have went out and cleaned them up. And when we do one out there, we do them all. So can we set standards for contractors to do it the same way we do in town? We can, yeah. It's just it's been one guy doing the lake for a lot of years and probably wouldn't like it if I told him how to plow the streets that he's been plowing for 30 years. So, Rob, Ken, but, whoever. Oh. But the taxpayers are the ones that are going to be the burden of this if we decide to pay for it. Right. Is there any way, um, kind of address this to the whoever, is there any way to you know, maintain that snow, like kind of piggybacking off of Steve. Is there anywhere in that property that the snow can just be pushed and maintained there? So, you know, I know we have a different setup where I live, but we maintain all of our snow all year long. You know, we kind of hang on to it and let it melt <laughs> wherever it is. And I was just wondering if on that property, if they have an option to get that snow someplace where they're not dinking into the curb or those kind of things. If I could speak to that, um, there may be some possibilities, but um, again, I mentioned I'm a lake scientist. I've tried to help clean up Lake Compesca, Lake Pelican, the Upper Big Sioux River watershed for over 30 years. Still working on it, and thank you very much for taking the stand you did on Stony Point. We really appreciate that. But in any case, um, one of the things I picked up along the way over the years is that you want to do everything possible to keep contaminants out of our, you know, water bodies. And there are a lot of contaminants in street, in the snow off the streets. Not so much here because we don't have a lot of traffic, but I think in my own opinion, it would be better to get that snow removed out of there before it melts and gets to the lake. Okay, I think that this will be a discussion, Rob, that uh, you and I and... and uh uh, probably the police department, our regular snow people that we get together and take a look at it. Uh, as far as the curbing goes, I know there will be more discussion coming up on it. 
You have something you want to say? Yeah, I just say I have serious concerns about uh, <clears throat> a whole section of town being excluded. Well, you know, that makes no sense to me. I have neighbors with rocks as curbs right. because they can't afford it, but we're not going to help them, yeah. but we'll help other people. Well, yeah, Brad, and maybe that was a little out of context, but what I'm saying is uh, the areas of town that have the old square curb is likely going to be falling into our, our reconstruction program. So we would want to do curb and pavement sections all together so that everything gels together and we get that drainage taken care of. It's very hard to do a section by section piece with the curb without the gutter pan in it to set elevation from. So we, we've, it's almost got to be a two step or a complete project. I can't just drop modern curb sections into the square curb very well but so it's it's a different scope of thing with the square curb than it is the modern curb so shane in your proposal this is just kind of more of a thought process i guess if you had a, a situation where you were going to replace a road reconstruct a road and there were sections that has no curb and gutter would this help fund that we could if you want i mean Actually, we're subs subsidizing a private improvement of a public roadway, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so because the curb is, once it's installed, it's turned over to the public and we own it, maintain yeah. it. So actually what we're doing is encouraging if, if somebody has a problem in front of their house and they want to take care of it, but we don't have the resources to go after that whole block mm -hmm. and they want to fix something right in front of their house, then we would help them replace it instead of us having to replace it. Okay. That's what the program would be intended for. And we, we did put this on the work session so we could have some of these yep. questions and, and things, but um, we'll, we'll discuss it and look at a very near yep. future date and put it on yep. the agenda. I appreciate the discussion yeah. and look forward to direction. Okay, so. and we'll move on then. Uh, I wanna, want you to bring up the Prairie Lakes Hospital uh, part up there now at this time. And what I'm looking for is uh, St. Anne's Hill, if you would, Shane. This is a spot, uh, folks, right to the right there. Right there, Shane, is where you're looking at. This is uh, going to be number 15 on your council agenda this evening. Uh, what, the, what the hospital is doing, as you know, they're uh, doing an expansion with the dermatology clinic and, and so on, which will be to the east, southeast of their hospital. What the hospital is looking at doing right where he has his cursor at is uh, putting improvements there. They're looking at putting pavement in, infrastructure in, lighting in, and then a temporary dermatology clinic. Okay, everybody with me on that so far? So what the hospital is asking us is if we would lease them that land and they would do those uh, improvements by putting in the parking lot they would keep the parking lot clean uh, year round. And in 2018, when the hospital is completed, they would then uh, remove the temporary dermatology building and we would be asking for, which we are already asking someone to build a warming house for kids to go up and down the hill that they can put in there and just set right down. And uh, as I said, the hospital would continue to keep the parking lot clean for us. It'd be kind of a win-win situation. And what we're looking at is uh, a very minimal lease for the land for them to put in that infrastructure, basically for us, at a, uh, a dollar a year, I believe is what it is. That was going to be my recommendation. They're going to pay for the improvements in the parking lot itself? They will do everything. We will have no cost involved in uh, uh, anything that they're doing. Okay. That would be... My recommendation to, I mean, just to make it legal, a dollar a year or so. You guys got any heartburn with that? That's, I think it's kind of a fun plan. You know, we can uh, get a little warming house put out there where you can have hot chocolate for the kids, maybe a, a Lions Club or Optimus or any of the, any of the groups, Kiwanis or even the Rotarians could be out there, Dan. Are we infringing on any land that was promised or, you know, there's a time when they said, couldn't do anything on the land west of the hospital. <coughs> right, and that's a great question. So I actually had uh, Justin 
do a search on that, and he brought out all the uh, all the numbers. And Justin, sure. if you want to share that with us, will do, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councilman Albertson. The uh, two lots that you see there, um, if I could have control of the mouse. So what you see here, and I'll Justin, see. Justin, can you slide that mic closer to you? Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, what you see here are two lots. And those two lots correspond to Curlin's Outlot 1. The city owns this portion down below here, and uh, the hospital owns this portion up here. Now, there was a point in time when the city owned both parcels. Um, this portion down below was provided to the city in the 70s. And then at some point later on, uh, or was provided in the 70s, and then uh, this portion was provided to the city by St. Anne's Hospital. Uh, since that time, this portion has reverted back to St. Anne's, uh, now Prairie Lakes, and the city has kept this portion. This portion down below has no encumbrance on its land use. This portion up here, when St. Anne deeded it over to the city, did have a restriction that it be used for park purposes. But it has since gone back to uh, uh, Prairie Lakes Hospital, uh, deed to that land has, and the city has provided a 100-foot strip here to uh, Prairie Lakes where the requirement there is that they use this 100-foot strip for parking lot purposes. So that gives you a broader conception of how the land lays there. But suffice it to say that this lot down here where that parking lot would be built under the lease does not have that encumbrance on it that it be dedicated for park use. When did that property to the north go back to the hospital? Uh, Councilman Solomon, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have the, the deed um, information here at City Hall uh, because obviously we don't have it anymore. Uh, the 100-foot portion that I mentioned here was deeded over uh, to to Prairie Lakes Hospital in uh, 1990. So presumably around that time, if, if we were deeding that over for parking lot purposes and the parking lot is now on that whole chunk, uh, I would assume without having done the register of deeds research that that occurred in 1990. So are either one of those two pieces of property, are they designated parkland or were they? They were. The northern portion was designated as parkland, but it was designated by St. Anne's Hospital, and their successors now are Prairie Lakes. Um, and so, uh, you know, insofar as there's any restriction on that property, having reverted back to the original, uh, you know, encumberer, if you will, is, is a good question, but uh, we obviously don't have title to that land, so... Because the story of, you know, for quite some time, all the while I've been on the council and previous to that is when the Whitwams donated that property to the city that there was nothing ever to be built there uh, on that section from the hospital property all the way south. That is always something that I've always, and anybody up in that neighborhood and many people have always stood by, and including the Park and Rec Board, is that that was property that was supposed to be maintained just as is because I know when they built the retention pond you can see it at the south end down there uh, yeah right south a little farther right there I know there is quite a discussion when that was built down there but it wasn't a structure mm -hmm. it was just an earthen holding pond is what it was, was placed there but I think you're gonna yeah I don't know that that's just the, that was what has been the story for Sure. Well, yeah, 40, it, 40 some and, years on that property and, up and, there. And council I think it was clear on the deed. That's right. I have a copy of it right here. The warranty deed from Merle Whitwam and Alice K. Whitwam has, uh, and this is dated April 23rd, 1973, has no encumbrance on it as St. Anne's deed did, specifying that it be for park purposes. Rather, all it says is it gives the legal description and transfer constitutes a gift, no transfer tax required. That's the extent of so what's provided what on the warranty deed. John, is, is just kind of a, you know, the, the St. Anne side did have that in the deed, and it did have, but the, the south half 
did not. And and I would add, Mayor, that this matter did come up before the city council in the early 90s when there was a push to have that land converted into a park. And what happened is uh, at the last minute, uh, Prairie Lakes came through uh, at the time and wrote a letter to the city council asking for reconsideration because they had information that showed that Mr. Whitwam did not want any encumbrance on the land. Um, and it'll require going back into my memory banks, but uh, they had quotes from Mr. Whitwam saying that land should not be dedicated for park purposes. He had relatives that served on the city council, and he was aware of the importance of not having any sort of dedicated use for that land, providing flexibility to the city council. Now, that's just my recollection of what was in that letter from Prairie Lakes, but that's what kept that land from being dedicated as a park in the early 90s. So, John, I just have a question. Are you saying, I'm just trying to follow your train of thought here. Are you saying that by a warming house up there, there might be people that do not want to see a warming house for? No, I didn't say that. I just was what? always under the assumption that that was what that property, that's what I had been told for many uh -huh. years, and I've heard at different park and rec meetings, and that's just what, uh, I wanted to be clear that that's what the, the deed shows. Okay. And I mean, I'm not totally against it. I no, just no, wanted I to make sure because going back in history, I've lived two blocks from there all my life and I've heard plenty of times over the years that that was not ever to be built and touched on that property. And, and Councilman Solom, I'd be happy to, uh, I have the file over here that contains all the, I'd be happy to look it over with you and, and, and we can. I believe you. Together. Thank you, sir. Even though you, you got some kind of title, I don't know, a lawyer or something, I guess. Uh. It's inconsequential. Okay, I think I hit on, uh, on all my talking points here this evening. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything else. Does you guys have anything else you need to touch on? Mayor, I had a, an email from one of the people along the lake concerning the pickup again of the, and wondering if there was any way we could let people know. Uh, I'll use my daughter, and she is not one because I take care of her garbage collection, but she lives in Brandon. If she's up here on Saturday and Sunday, she doesn't get the newspaper. She doesn't read the anything. So theoretically, she could put her garbage can out when she leaves on Sunday thinking it's going to be out on Monday and it will sit there until the next Friday. The question came to me as a concern is, could we send an email to people, and they're just asking a question, could we send an email to people who have property on the lake that don't live in that property? It's just a, not just, it's another home, but it's not where they reside. And like my daughter's been here five times this summer on the weekends. Well, I take care of her garbage, it's not a problem for her, but the next door neighbor is from Sioux Falls, and I don't know who's told them or, so is there a way to let people who live out of town know what the situation is and they need to get somebody, get me to go move their garbage can out on Thursday night? You, Dan, you can sign up on the city's website for any alerts that they send out. And those alerts are set, aren't those alerts sent out? I don't know. I mean, I get alerts every day. On, I think I signed up for just about everything, and I get alerts every day about something. But Yeah, and I don't know if there's any alert for the garbage pickup. Well, and, and that would be simple. That would be the simple I, fix for it. Yeah, I, I do think that um, it's not a bad idea. I don't, you know. I don't know if that could be done because I don't imagine there are a lot of homes that right. people. You know, I think that's, uh, that's a pretty good idea, and, and we can look into it. Okay, if there's nothing else, I will adjourn this meeting. We'll be back at 7 o'clock. Oh, mm, no, yeah, come on up, sorry, you got to be quicker in that, man. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to bring this meeting back to order here. All right. Well, what we're hoping to do, Spencer, Tenike, IT department for the city, um, I was hoping to just bring this up in front of you guys um, before 
the next meeting. Um, the excuse me. One of the uh, topics that we've been talking about is the phone system, the the centralized servers, the networking in between, uh, in between those. So, what I wanted to do is just give you guys kind of an idea of what we're looking at. I don't know if that's big enough, but right now you can kind of see that we've got multiple different um, um, internet connections on each one of our departments. And we've got a couple fiber connections that we utilize, but we also still have our dedicated internet connections at those departments even. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give you an idea that this is how it's currently working. It's multiple businesses, multiple different, you know, networks that we manage. Um, and what we're proposing, and you'll see next week, or next meeting is, uh, a structure that looks more like this where we don't have all those internet connections and we we pipe them all to a central city hall with a with replication over to the police department and have um, and have a centralized internet and this is all in conjunction with a phone system um, that would be through vast um, it's a cloud-based system and that's my that'll be a recommendation that I'll bring up next week our, sorry, next council meeting. Um, just to kind of give you some background is this has been on my plate since the day I started is I, I've been hearing that we need new phones at City Hall. We need to find a phone system for the community center. Um, and the fire, I know the fire departments is getting relatively dated too. So we've got some phone needs. And then also since day one, we've always been talking about this fiber project. How are we going to get this thing off the ground? Um, so we're trying, what's great about this is we're trying to hit two birds, one stone. And uh, uh, we kind of bounce through the whole fiber project. Trenching fiber is nice, but it's very costly. It takes a lot of time to do. MPLS lines through an ISP are usually very expensive. Uh, biggest factor there <laughs> is it cost can we afford it and then vpns are a little slow and a little more unreliable so we're trying to am i am i talking too much <laughs> so um we're, we went through a number of different scenarios where we thought that that it would make sense to what's what makes the most sense we're kind of at a standstill we either spend too much money or it takes forever to get done well in conversations with Vast, as I brought this up, they said, how can we help you? And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I talked to um, Mitchell, and their local ISPs work with them and give them very good rates on MPLS lines. Um, I said, you know, it'd be nice if we had a partnership like that. And they, they kind of, oh, geez, this guy, you know. So they go back to the drawing board, and they say, if you guys are willing to look at a phone system through us and work on a dedicated internet, we will give you an MPLS line at the locations with phones. And I went, whoa, that's, that's, a, that's a, quite a deal. To give you an idea, each one of these lines, I'm estimating $400 a month is an MPLS line. And, and that's probably on the low side. So we're looking at 16 different locations where we'll actually, where we could actually have those MPLS lines, and they're providing that free of charge if we obviously go and work out the phone system and a centralized internet connection. I can't read your little boxes, but up in the top left, you have an internet. Yeah, right there. That's not connected to the central server in any way. What What do we got up there? Senior Citizen Center, Event Center. Okay. Upper Big Sioux. So that wouldn't have a we, we could put a VPN over there. Uh, okay. They're not high priorities. For I got gotcha. you. I, I was mean, just curious as to the, the what the Senior Citizen Center doesn't need access to a server. So I wasn't, nor would we probably put phones there. I don't think, I don't think we pay for their phone bill there, do we? I'm not 100% on that one. I, I don't think we pay for their internet bill actually either. I don't know. If we okay. if we hook up with Vast, if we did that on this, would would there be an op would, would there be an option down the road if we wanted to switch carriers? 
I mean, um, if, if say they kept raising their price to the point where it was ridiculous, yeah. and we wanted to, yeah, we'd be locked into a uh, contract. With be, well, I shouldn't say our price would be locked for five years. Uh, but we w- would have an escape clause, but we'd go into the contract assuming that we would fulfill the, that contract length. Because I'll tell you, this isn't a small IT task from my side of the house to just swap providers. Oh, so we would have, there would be capability to switch if, if we wanted to down Correct. the road. Okay. Yeah, but we're working on the, on the contract. Right. And, and, and I'd like to just step in, Spence, you know, just so you guys get an idea with why we're doing that. Uh, when Spencer came on board, one of the goals that we've had together is that we get everything kind of centralized for him. And this really has worked out to be an extremely uh, good thing for you, cost-wise, efficiency-wise, phone-wise, you know, because we've had dollars budgeted for City Hall and for other areas to, to get new phone services. So this is a um, pretty good step, and it's a big step. And it's something that you wouldn't get done overnight. Yeah, it, it would take a little bit of time. Um, just so you know that I, I'm i kind of giving you the two-second tour, but I, I, uh, I got seven, I got seven uh, f- phone system provider c- people that quoted me systems. I had seven on-premise quotes and three cloud-based quotes. So, I mean, we, we, we did a deep dive here, you know. So it's not like, oh, fast, that came knocking on the door and we went with them. Was, this has been a very long process and a lot of research being done on this. I'll say I think you guys have done a really good job of staying focused and on this this whole process of trying to change this. And in, in the long run, it's going to save – I think we'll have better service, and it's going to save the city a lot of money. So, if you just flip kudos. back. Yeah, if you just flip back to your other picture, I can't imagine what a maintenance and time-consuming nightmare that is. You know, the biggest thing is I try to keep, I try not to put that value. I mean, I sh- I definitely see the value in uh, consolidating, but I try not to value that too much. I try to find value other places and i think this system is more than a value for it but down the road for everybody right yeah spencer what's the total cost of switching it if we were to if we were to go with it (laughs) that's i mean we're we're talking about a complete change of um total cost over how long this is a instead of it being a one-time expense we're talking about a monthly fee for a phone per desk or per phone so it's a completely different way of um of paying for the service. So my only question is, I guess maybe to Shelley, is so we're fine with that? It doesn't have to go out for bids or the way he's got it? I mean, he's kind of already did that, but right. to stay technology, legal. This type of technology is excluded from the bid laws, okay. so we're not required to do that. He did do a thorough vetting yeah. Yeah. Of, all of all the options, so we're, we're good with that. And as far okay. as, as the money... Um, I, I guess I've always had the understanding that if it's in the best interest of the city and in the long run, we're basically changing capital dollars into operating dollars. And um, it, it's just it's going to be um, something ongoing that, that the mayor and I are going to have to figure out how to make work. But if it's in the best interest of the city, we're going to figure that out. And I think it's Well, it looks like in the long run it's going to be yep. way more reasonable. And we're going to get things done. Yep. I think we'll yeah, we've been picking away twenty five thousand dollars a year to, to right. invest in. Right. See, that's that's where I think we're we're just kind of switching the little basket. Yep. So you just we're going to see an increase in operating, but I think overall we're going to see less of of that the capital. capital side and we're, of it. We're going to see um, maybe a little bit um, on the IT side too, just a, just a little bit of a change for them. And and in the long run, it should save us considerable else. amount of money. But right. just coming right. coming out of a different right. purse. I think but if you look at it, aren't they paying internet service on every one of those clouds right now? Yes, they are. And you're going to have it centralized, so most of it's going to be through one Internet service. Correct. Um, and then a couple that are set aside yeah, that have most, a separate mostly out. Mostly the guest networks is what I was yes. thinking, is we might want to port them through a separate Internet connection. Just so so not we wouldn't have people going through our securities. Yeah. Which we can do. We can do some stuff with. But. It does. Um, okay, we talked a little bit about the um, server setup and all those kind of things. The phone system, does that have some significant advantages? I know you've been trying to get it all, Absolutely. you know, so that we would be able to pick up a phone and not me personally, but I mean, not have to dial. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can you speak a little bit to? This, 
Yeah. Right. I should have hit advantage. on that. That's like the main reason we're talking phone systems. There I'm talking go. network. I got too crazy. But um, absolutely. One of the biggest advantages with a cloud-based phone system is, uh, let's just say down the road there uh, a new building gets built. Uh, it's a pretty big deal if we got to get fiber trench there and, you know, depending on where it lands. Uh on an on-premise system, on a cloud-based system is as long as we have internet, we can at least have phones. So uh, that was the biggest thing is we can pick up these cloud-based phones and plop them anywhere, pretty much with internet. Um, The other thing is um, we're talking about a long, long time frame to get a citywide phone system. I mean, to get all the fiber trenched and to get the network connectivity. This kind of simplifies it, and even if we don't have, you know, even if we don't, you know, get past all these internet connections, if we have those, if we have this cloud-based system, is we can simply make it, call an extension like we're all in the same building. Um, there's also another added advantage to this phone system is there'd also be something called UCC. Um, where you can tell if um, someone's on the phone or if you want to chat, you know, just a quick, hey, are you busy? Can I stop by to run this by you? Uh, There's some chat functionality and also uh, cell phone pairing potential for people with uh, city um, cell phone um, stipends, like department heads. So um, it's it's pretty feature-rich. I think what we were doing in the past, trying to pick away a little bit here and there, and I... I don't even feel we're ever even ke- keeping up with tech. I think we were going farther behind every year instead of even trying to get caught up. So yeah, you know the only the only concern I see with this is it would be nice, and I know that we're I'm asking for for a change of money, but that that twenty five thousand would definitely help get the uh, polish this off this year, assuming we can get the twenty five thousand and this. Um, and this process going, but we could probably make it work without it. It's just, it's, it might be cutting it a little close if we need firewalls or switching, you know, just to, we could probably get by though. These are kind of a plug and play phone. One of the things Spencer said to us is that uh, if there's a fire, just grab your phone and run. <laughs> take it home. You yeah, can, you can take your phone home if you, if you wanted to. All you need is internet connection. Right. So. Well, thanks, I was Spence. joking about the fire thing. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Spencer. Is there any other questions for him? Otherwise, I think um, Todd, I was going to have you come up, but I think we're running out of time. Uh, we'll do that on the council agenda. All right. Well, thank you, guys. And at this time, I will. Adjourn-